I want to welcome you to, I can't believe I'm saying it's 2013, but it is. And I heard that 2013 is actually the year of digital health. That's what the press is saying. But I'm pretty sure that next year, what you're going to hear out of me is 2014 is the year of digital health. And you'll keep hearing that because the growth is, is astronomical. And we're just excited to kind of go along for the ride and be able to showcase these kinds of things for you. And what a ride it has been to plan these, this particular show for you this year. The caliber of speakers this year is literally off the charts. And I often sent my thanks to the conference gods that enabled us to pull together a show beyond my wildest management, excuse me, my wildest imagination. If you look around you and if you check out the agenda that we crafted, crafted lovingly for you, you'll be amazed at the talented and committed pioneers present in this room. Throughout the year, I've had the privilege to spend countless hours on the phone with all of our sponsors, exhibitors, and speakers. I hear most of you already have my number on speed dial. And if you're trying to use it right now, it's MIA, so don't bother. And as these discussions have helped curate two full days of some of the most relevant and pressing topics driving deep discussion and revelations about digital health now and in the future, I do believe that discussions had here in this Digital Health Summit room have the power to bring about the change we're all striving for in healthcare. So with that said, we literally are off to the races. We couldn't, let me get this ready. Um, I'm gonna go ahead. We could not have done any of this without our sponsors. The support of our sponsors means everything to us. It actually helps us put together this quality content. So I'm gonna start with our platinum sponsors, Qualcomm Life, United Health Group and Optum, Massimo, Life Technologies, Omron, Ergotron, Ideal Life, Continua, Alliance, Continua Health Alliance and Amp Plus. Our gold sponsors, AARP, Texas Instruments, Good Chime, Brain Resources, Interaxon, and Share Care. And the exciting part about looking at these slides this year is that so many of them are new to us and keep bringing and innovating to this field. So it's really kind of exciting to see the growth of this show over the years, if any of you have been in the audience the last couple of years. So let me go back to something new we're doing. Um, this year, I've always wanted to kind of tear down these walls and share what goes on in this room that the rest of the world can see what's going on. So I had the opportunity to bring AARP on to sponsor a special digital health live TV. And it's basically digital health in real time. We will be doing live photography, videos, interviews, blogging, tweeting, the whole social, you know, the whole social world. If you open your agenda, you can see on the front page of that agenda, there's actually a, li a list of all of our social media channels. One of the most important ones is the digital health main uh, dashboard, and we're calling it the dashboard. There will be a Mondo pad, I think it's gonna be outside, that's gonna kind of bring together the whole picture of Facebook, the conversation. Now you wanna know how to be a part of that conversation. Very, very simple. Follow us at DH Summit. That's the easy part. The next part is when you tweet. I only listed one of them here, but I'm going to give you a second one. Tweet with Digi Health CES, D I G I H E A L T H C E S. And the other thing is to be part of the big conversation at CES is hashtag 2013 CES. So those are the so so the excuse me those are the things that'll kind of keep you in the conversation and what we are hoping for is for this to actually live well beyond the show. So we will be continuing to post videos, post photos, conversations. We did a whole bunch of incredible pre-Skype interviews with a lot of our big speakers here today. So I think it's going to be a really fun uh, start. It's it's our beginning to kind of reach outside the walls of the LVCC. Okay. Now on to the fun stuff. So this next session, um, and it's a, a really important one, and some people keep asking me, well, why are you bringing military? What does military have to do with health? Uh, well, 
kind of stupid, but what, is it, what does it have to do with consumer health? And the reality is, is that I've learned so much through the years. And the developments that happen, oh, sorry, it changed already. Uh, the developments that happen on the forefront that, uh, that these innovators are actually bringing to people in the field in need at most, those are the greatest inventions sometimes that come out into the healthcare field for civilians. For consumers, we can call them whatever we want to call them. So this session is bringing together not only one of the most incredible doctors on television in the field who cares about this space, but it also brings together some of the leading innovators that are bringing some of these technologies that, in my opinion, are, are mind-blowing. And not only saving lives on the front line, but soon to be saving, you know, these, the, these implications will be saving lives in our own backyards, in our own hospitals, et cetera. So, we'll leave it at that. They'll be able to show off their stuff. I want to introduce you to our team. I'm going to actually bring them all up first. Um, is, can the, the speakers come up? Sorry, my bad. Where are you? Wowza. So I'm going to introduce you to the moder our moderator, and then he'll t kind of let him take it from there. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, as you probably all know very well, is CNN's medical director. And so one of the things we asked to do this year was rather than have you, uh, me repeat everything that is in your agenda, I really, uh, and read his bio to you verbatim, I'd much rather tell you a few fun facts about him. Um, and uh, I think the expertise speaks for itself. So um, I don't know if he knows this yet. <laughs> so my favorite one was that still, with all the technology available out there, he still calls his wife for directions. <laughs> so I'm going to leave that one because that was my favorite one. And um, welcome this panel. <laughs> don't kill me. I wish my wife were here to hear that. Um, Thank you for having me. I'm really uh, delighted to be here. Uh, it's a little strange, I'll preface by saying, talking to real live people. I don't get to do this very often. It's usually in a, in a dark studio somewhere. Um, but I, but I, th this is something I've really been looking forward to. I've spent a lot of time uh, as a reporter uh, doing things in the battlefield and seeing how medicine and the military really uh, interact. I've been studying this very closely for 11 years. And I think a lot of what you're going to hear today uh, from this, this re remarkable panel is going to give you a real glimpse into where we've been and also where we're headed in this particular space. It's, it's really interesting stuff. I'm also a confessed gadget guy. I just love gadgets uh, of all sorts. I'm glad, in fact, that you can't buy things here. Otherwise, I uh, probably, probably spent all my money. But I, I have seen it certainly in medicine, how a lot of these gadgets uh, can be used, but also in my own life uh, as well. Uh, one of the things I, I will say uh, as a starting point, and there's this little cartoon here that I think uh, makes a point. Some of you may see in this cartoon about the Mayan calendar. I only had enough room to go up to 2012. That's going to freak somebody out someday. <laughs> the, the, the idea that we're doing things now that uh, are going to have an impact far down the road, and we may not always be able to predict those things, I think is a really important theme. And also, do we develop technology and then try and find a need for it, or are there particular needs that is subsequently driving the te technology. Think about that a little bit today as we're having our conversation. Uh, it influences, as I say, the way that we all live. I mean, I myself, outside again of the operating room, you know, buying my tickets online, checking emails. Um, you know, I might do a live shot from here later on using satellite technology and, and, and a truck somewhere parked outside the hotel. Later on tonight, I, you know, I always do this. I Skype with my girls whenever I'm on the road. There they are, so they, they usually uh, get a chance to talk. It's really funny, they grew up in the world of Skype. They've never known life without it. So being a television guy, they don't know when, it, they're on, when I'm on Skype versus on TV. So they often try and talk to me when I'm on the television. You get very upset when. Um, but part of the reason I showed those particular technologies is because all of them were made possible, as probably many of you know in this room, because of something known as DARPA, the Defense, uh, Defense Advanced Research Projects Association. I'm sure all of you have heard of this, but you may not have known that it's been around since 1958. It's sort of the military R&D arm. And it's, it was designed to sort of take the latest and greatest innovations and put them 
somewhere out on the battlefield, and for every other field, uh, for that matter. Uh, one of the greatest innovations, as you may have heard, uh, coming out of DARPA was the internet. Oh, Matt, get, get that slide out of that. that wasn't the, uh, the, the original, sorry about that. The original purpose was to actually link and aggregate uh, radar monitoring uh, centers from all over the country uh, to try and thwart a, a possible uh, nuclear attack from the Soviets. That was the original ARPANET of the internet, and nowadays more, more people use it to, to download games like Angry Birds. But since the beginning of the, the Industrial Revolution, there's been this push, I think, to try and find these innovations that can be put, put out in the battlefield as quickly as possible. And I think nowhere is that more concrete and more logical than when it comes to our health. And we're seeing some of those advances, again, on the battlefield, benefiting all of us in civilian life during peacetime as well. I just want to give you a couple of examples of what we're talking about. I mean, from simple to complicated, uh, these things that were originally developed for the battlefield, very, very important now in civilian life, from the first aid bag to, to a tourniquet that you had to actually be able to apply for yourself, ambulances, life flights, blood banks. Uh, they needed a longer needle to be able to take care of pneumothorax in the field for someone who had a pen, uh, chest injury that was developed originally uh, for the battlefield. Uh, airways that anybody could put in and someone who had lost their airway suddenly. Again, these are all things that were needed in the battlefield because of the tremendous uh, number of patients at any given time. Sonar. Sonar was originally developed for the battlefield and we now use it to, to find tumors that are deep within somebody's body. One of the things that's uh, coming out now, it's very interesting to me, I just saw, heard about this a couple days ago, it's not yet FDA approved, something known as InfraScan. As a neurosurgeon, I can tell you one of the most challenging things is to try and determine if someone has a blood collection in the brain and where exactly that blood collection is. If you have a CT scan or an MRI scanner, that becomes easy. You can obviously get a scan, but what if you don't? What if you're in that resource poor environment? What if you want to uh, keep ordering MRI or CT scans even within a hospital? This uses near infrared, eight points on the head, and you can get a pretty good idea if someone has a blood collection. Again, it's not something that's, uh, that people are using uh, yet, but this is a, sort of a little bit of a glimpse into the future. Um, there, there's something else I wanted to show you real quick. Uh, this is something that I saw first on the battlefield. It's called quick clot. Uh, I don't know if you've, you've heard of this, uh, but this is something I ended up seeing getting used quite a bit in Iraq and Afghanistan. What's so fascinating, it's not just a pressure dressing. What this also takes advantage of is what you're seeing on this slide over here, being able to activate something that we all learned in medical school pretty early on called the clotting cascade. And specifically, you don't need to remember this, but this activates factor 12. And so even in cases of very severe bleeding, something like this can cause hemostasis within three to five minutes. You can imagine why that would be of such great benefit on a battlefield, but again, also in civilian life as well. You know, we, we've, we've been looking at these advances really over the last 11 years, since 2001, and I've been in many of these places, again, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, we talk about the golden hour a lot, and it is really critical, that hour where you want to get someone to definitive care, but I think because of a lot of the technology you're going to hear from our panel today, it's turned into that platinum 10 minutes, and, and, and that's because of the technologies, I think, that's making uh, care uh, even quicker, and as a result, I think really improving mortality rates. Some of our greatest lessons in medicine have come from the battlefield. That's true. I've been hearing that since I was in medical school, and I think there's a real reason for that. You have these, these situations that it's going to sound very familiar to innovators in this room, but immediate need in a resource-poor environment, and that's sort of forcing the innovation. Now, as I mentioned, I, I've seen a lot of this, this firsthand um, in Afghanistan, uh, you know, in the Roll 3 hospitals over there, in Iraq, uh, I was there for several months. I've seen men and women working under very, very difficult circumstances, and they have a need for this technology, and, and, and also, just as important, they have a need for that technology to actually improve outcomes and to never fail under some pretty harsh conditions. And then subsequently, to be able to take those things and think about how it could be applied to civilian life as well. And, and that's, that's the majority of what we're going to be talking about today. I want to give you a couple of quick examples of, of things that I've seen. One of my more unflattering moments uh, had to do when I took a ride with the Blue Angels. I was in the back of an F-18. I uh, was under lots of G-forces and never done it. And I get motion sick as it is, so this was probably not a good idea for me. But just take a look at this clip. Within seconds, I experienced something most humans never will. More than six Gs. My body experienced more than six times the force of gravity. Oh, jeez. Everything from the skin on my face to the organs in my body were pushed back 
toward the ground. During an inverted roll, yes, these planes do fly upside down, my vision started becoming blurry and gray. It's called graying out. At 4 G's, you lose color vision. At 4 and a half G's, you can go temporarily blind. Higher G's and your lungs collapse, making it hard to breathe, and the blood pools in your legs. I may have lost consciousness. Dr. Goop, are you with me? <laughs> um, yeah, the, 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 uh, it, it was an amazing flight. The, these guys, they wear these, these suits. I was wearing one of these suits. They're, they're not these, these pressurized suits people are familiar with called mass trousers, which will actually uh, compress certain parts of your body to keep blood into your chest and your brains. They don't wear those, which is why I did pass out. Uh, there's something else, too, if you just zoom in on the, on the lower part of that thing there. There's, that, there's a zippered pocket down there, in case you're curious. That's where they keep all the barf bags. I went through two of them uh, during that flight. We didn't show you that part. Uh, but, this is, but this is really important to be able to monitor people in these, these difficult situations. Again, a pilot in this situation, uh, someone who is uh, in a remote location, uh, that's a lot of, uh, it's, it's become an increasingly important thing, and I think Anmol Sood will be talking uh, a fair amount about that and how that need is going to grow in the years to come. Um, I, I also spent a lot of time uh, in Iraq covering the war in spring of, of 2003. I was there for a couple of months embedded with a group of doctors known as the Devil Docs. Um, that's a colloquial name given to Navy doctors who support the Marines in these types of situations. And they, they are some of the most remarkable people you'll ever meet. But they, one of the challenges they had was to, to take a tent, in this case known as an FRSS, a forward resuscitative surgical system, and make it something that could be put up and taken down within an hour and hopscotch around the battlefield as needed. What they had learned during the Gulf War in 1991, that it was simply taking too long to get people back to definitive care. And during that transit, people were dying uh, of preventable deaths. So in, this, in 2003, they decided to take some of the more precious commodities of a battlefield and move them far forward. And that's what you're looking at there, a dusty desert tent in the middle uh, of Iraq. And, and one day when I was actually out there, I was asked to literally take off my journalist cap, put on a surgeon's cap, so to speak, and operate on a young man uh, named Jesus Vidana, a, uh, a young man who had been shot in the back of the head. And this gives you a little bit of an idea of just what this was like. There, there weren't many uh, options in terms of resources here. We didn't have all the equipment that we needed. I actually had to sterilize the bit of a Black & Decker drill to remove the part of his bone to take off uh, that, that area where he had been injured. And uh, we ended up uh, having to create an outer layer of his brain when this operation was all over. The only thing sterile in that dusty desert tent was the inside of an IV bag. So I took an IV bag, filleted that open, and used that to create the outer layer of his brain. I tell you the story in part because it gives you an idea of how quickly you just have to innovate when you're in an area like this. And when you, when you get to sit with a panel like this, you, 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 you almost can see their minds work to try and address situations. Uh, like the one I'm describing. I will tell you, uh, Jesus, who, you know, we didn't know how he was going to do. We put him on a Black Hawk helicopter after I was done with the operation. I wasn't sure that I was going to hear from him again. I get a call in my office one day from a San Diego area code, and this, this guy is on the phone, and he says, is, is this Dr. Gupta? I have an update on one of your patients. And I said, I, I think you might have the wrong Dr. Gupta. As it turns out, there's quite a few of us. Um, uh, <laughs> He said, uh, no, I think, I think I have the right guy. Uh, do you remember operating on uh, Jesus Vidana in Iraq? And I, and I said, how, how could I forget operating on Jesus in the middle of the desert? <laughs> yeah. And I was so curious how he'd done. And, and he said he, 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 he had done well. He had a little bit of left hand weakness, but that was about it. And I really wanted to go visit him. So one day, uh, when I was in Southern California, I decided to pay him a visit. I had never seen him but uh, beaten and battered on the desert floor. And I went to his house, and he answered the door. He's a handsome guy. He gives me a hug. His mother comes out. She's so sweet. She, she takes my hands and says, thank you. Then his dad comes out. And dads can often be different than moms, right? He comes out, and he says, are you the guy that operated on my son? I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, and you're a journalist? He <laughs> <laughs> wanted the military to do better, apparently, with regard to that. But you know, one of the things, and one of the reasons I showed you this clip was because I couldn't help but think, as I've gotten to know the work of, of Colin and, and Yulin Wong, uh, what a, a robot in that situation possibly could have offered. And uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about something that uh, is colloquially known as the Chung Bot. And this is an is a, is a option that allows uh, uh, some of the best trauma surgeons from all over the world 
to come see uh, what, what's happening in a, in a remote location. I th and I think we have a clip of that as well. Uh, but to actually see this robot, so uh, here I took a tour with it at the, at the medical center here, but you can see a robot like this. This is one of the earlier versions. You're going to see a newer version now. But imagine a robot like that allowing you to communicate uh, in a real way, allowing a surgeon from another part of the world being able to help dictate uh, what, what should happen during an operation and care for patients after that operation has been performed. You can only imagine the possibility, certainly on a battlefield, but just about anywhere else in the world. Um, it, it's just remarkable stuff. And again, two of the creators uh, are on our panel today, so we're going to talk about that. Th there's something else I just want to mention briefly, and then, and then we're going to get to the discussion, hopefully take some of your questions. But one of the things I've become increasingly interested in, and I think often get short shrift in any of these discussions, is the concept of mental health, especially with regard to our veterans. And um, people talk about post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, people have uh, had differing opinions on how best to treat it. I have done, for the last decade, lots of reporting uh, in this particular area. And I, and I wanted to talk about um, something that was sort of a, a little bit of a, it was a frightening experience in some ways for me, but as I learned, a very important experience as well. It, it's a sort of PTSD simulator. Think of it that way. We'll get a better description of it from Skip Rizzo here in just a few minutes. But uh, it's a traumatic thing for many of our vets who are returning. And we don't always know how best to address those concerns or what even rises now to the level of diagnosable PTSD. But this idea of immersing yourself back in certain situations uh, can be quite important and profound if done in a safe environment and allowing people to, to deal with what they've seen. I want to show you a quick clip of what I'm talking about. That is really frightening. I mean, you have no idea what's, what's happening right now. Just two of our vehicles have just looked like they've exploded. I can't tell if our vehicles are trying to get out of there as quickly as possible. I can feel my heart rate just starting to pound. Mm -hmm. Looks like we just took some gunfire. Some more gunfire. Now, I would be asking you, if we were working on a specific memory, to be recounting your memory and confronting that memory. Well, there was one time when we were, we were driving along, and all of a sudden, our convoy came under fire. Mm -hmm. What happened next? It was nighttime and saw all these tracer fire, I guess, hitting the front of the convoy in front of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we all just ducked down into the, into the truck as low as we could go. You're literally just sort of covering your head and mm -hmm. making sure your helmet chin strap is on as tight as it can be. Mm -hmm. What were you feeling at that point? Helpless. Totally helpless and really, really scared because I thought I was going to die. I didn't want to die like that. I am very uncomfortable right now, especially as I see, I'm trying to get this thing to get us out of here as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Every time I hear a new noise, I can feel my heart starting to pound. I can... I have a little bit of the shakes with my hands. It's, uh, it's Skip, I'll tell you, it's, it's hard to even watch that still. I, and, and I know you're going to talk about that. You, there's a later generation of this simulator now. But again, uh, this is an area, I think, in our society that often gets short shrift. So uh, the fact that someone like you is working on this and addressing it in a real way, I think, means a lot. Um, again, we're, we're going to hopefully want to take, take a lot of your questions. Our, our panel today is made up of, of Yulin Wong, uh, who, who we're just talking about with regard to the robot, and, 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 and Colin, uh, who, are, who have been partnered uh, putting this together, as you see there, for, for some time now. You're going to hear their story, and we're going to talk to them. Anmal Soud, um, Anmal, I've known of your work for some time, and I, I paid a lot of attention when I watched Felix Baumgarten uh, jump out of space recently. I was fascinated to watch that video over and over again, and to see what see firsthand what was happening in his body at that time is something that uh, I, I, I think is really interesting and, I, and I'm anxious to learn what it means for all of us. And of course, Skip Rizzo, you know, uh, your work in terms of helping people. Uh, and I'm not sure what that slide means, by the way, the, the, with, with, the, with the simulator on the, on the skull, but you, you, you'll, you'll tell us about that. It's, that's badass, I'll tell you that. That's, <laughs> but, um, but I'm really anxious to speak to all of you. I'll let you guys uh, introduce yourselves as well and, and tell us a little bit about your, your, your work, and then we'll, uh, then we'll, we'll start, we'll start our conversation. So I don't know if anybody wants to go first. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Anmol Sood, and I'm the CEO of Equivital, based in Cambridge in the UK. 
Uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Fleur, for the introduction and the, the, the interesting uh, start to this, uh, this summit. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me to talk about my company and, and what we do. Uh, as way of an introduction, I, I thought I'd talk about some of the brand philosophies and so, you know, what Equivital actually means to us and why it was developed. Equivital was actually developed to harness the power and value of mobile human data. That is data from real people in real environments. As a business, we, we're also a market leading brand that uh, develops and commercializes end-to-end -end systems and solutions for mobile human monitoring applications for the military, clinical, and hazardous worker sectors. Our end-to-end -end systems and solutions include four different components. Firstly, you have FDA-approved um, monitoring sensors and uh, regulators. You have data intelligence that's been internally developed. You have web, mobile, and PC-based applications for analysis and viewing of data. And you also have a database that allows you to aggregate and collect data from various sessions uh, beyond time. For some time now, actually, as, as, as Dr. Gupta mentioned, we've been working with various militaries around the world, um, various NATO allied forces around the world, to collect data both in training environments and operational environments. Um, this data has been used um, in places in front lines like Afghanistan and Iraq. And, and what we actually found was there was a paradox that we were seeing, whereby there was so much data, so much analysis, so much information available as to the efficiency and performance of various different types of military equipment on the battlefield and in the training environment, yet that same level of information and, and data was not actually available about one of the most valuable commodities in, on, on the field, which is the soldier themselves. With conditions such as PTSD, as was talked about, TBI, heat stress becoming more and more prevalent, what we're seeing is a dynamic shift to actually monitoring soldiers both in training and operational environments, both in real time and retrospectively, to allow for much more proactive, proactive management of um, welfare, safety, location, and actually performance of the soldier. Last November, we actually released our first end-to-end -end military system called Black Ghost. And what Black Ghost gives you the ability to do is capture and contextualize a whole set of data in order to actually view the performance, safety, and, and uh, welfare of, of, of a particular soldier or a group of soldiers. And what we're actually seeing is, as our systems are being used more and more in the military sector in such ruggedized and harsh environments, we're actually able to feed back into our design cycles to actually ensure that we're producing ro robust and reliable sensors and applications and systems that still produce high quality data. As many of you can see, so yeah, we, were, we were the monitoring system that monitored um, Felix Baumgartner during his Red Bull jump from 38,000 meters. But whilst the Black Ghost system that we've created is actually specifically designed for the military training system, what we're seeing is a natural progression, natural shift into B2B civilian marketplaces. Um, the latest example of that was a multi-site deployment we made over um, into the oil and gas market sector whereby we gave the, the particular partner we are working with the ability to monitor in real time performance, safety, welfare, and more importantly, ongoing well-being of his particular workers. And I say more importantly because actually it matters greatly whether you're looking at one particular session or one particular day, or you're looking at a multitude of sessions over a number of days to see how performance, how welfare, how well-being actually adapts and changes to the different environments, different conditions that these workers are in. Other civilian use cases we've been involved in, um, Felix Baumgartner, the Red Bull Jump, and also we're actually involved in testing commercial flight safety for uh, civilian passengers. With the Red Bull Jump, which, which you know, gave us a lot of exposure both in the UK and the US, we were really, really excited to, to be the first company and the first system to actually monitor someone who was traveling from that distance at that speed. And, and we worked very, very closely for two years with both NASA, who we were recommended by, and a Red Bull team to make sure that the system was reliable and robust enough to actually survive in those environments. For a business like ours, and, and if you notice the kind of progression of my slides, I'm trying to take us from where we started off, which was a military environment, over in more, much more into a consumer healthcare and consumer well-being uh, environment. But for a business like ours, <coughs> the... the <coughs> Sorry. The natural transition, the natural bridge to go into a sector that's suited to our technology, such as healthcare, is to actually work in B2B applications within those sectors. 
And due to a large amount of demand that's been placed on us by particular customers and particular partners, thank you. Um, We've recently developed and launched the Equivital Mobile Human Data Services for the pharmaceutical and healthcare R&D sectors. This particular application allows continuous analysis and monitoring of safety, efficacy, and effectiveness data during the entire drug development process. Looking at the consumer healthcare sector at a, at a macro level, what you're actually seeing is a massive dynamic, a massive shift from actually what healthcare was, which was treating the sickness, treating sicknesses and treating you know, the ill and the elderly, to actually much more proactive management and understanding of personal well-being and knowledge about oneself. What that realistically means is we're trying to empower people with more knowledge and more understanding about their particular body, about their particular condition, about how they are best suited and how they best adapt to a number of different environments. And what you're actually seeing is that whilst there's many technological advances and innovations being created <coughs> in, um, with business models and delivery models for healthcare services, actually what this enables the person to do, whether it be the actual provider of healthcare, whether it be the funder of healthcare, or the consumer themselves, is actually to gather more information, have greater transparency, and actually gain more value for money for what they're spending. If you, if you look at it at a, at, a, at a different level in terms of consumer welfare, consumer well-being, actually understanding the power of uh, genetic makeup, of physiological trends, and of wider data from the human body <coughs> actually shows you how much power and how much value these particular systems and this particular intelligence can have for a company like ours, but more importantly, for the end consumer. And, and what we actually see and what we actually say is it's great that there's so many advances in sensor technologies and analysis software and tools, but really where the uptake by a consumer, where the, the penetration into the consumer health and consumer well-being marketplace will actually take place, and the reason because of that will be from the creation of valuable forms of data intelligence and what we term actionable information. That means providing information either in real time or retrospectively that a particular user, a stakeholder in that ecosystem of, of healthcare can actually use to, to provide a particular action. We actually created our own database called the Vital E database. And, and what that database allows us to do is collect a multitude of different data, but actually either internally ourselves or with partners that we're working with, we're actually able to create much more about of, of this data intelligence and, and, and actionable information that will allow the, the future advancements in sensor technologies, in software and analysis tools to be powered with a true value proposition that customers, consumers, doctors, um, medical clinicians, military clinicians, whoever it may be, whoever the particular user is, to actually use these systems much more effectively, much more efficient, fish, efficiently, and much more proactively. So <clears throat> I thought I would give a, a, a bit of information about our particular systems, the, the ones that were used with uh, Felix Baumgartner, the ones that have been used with the US and European military and special forces, the ones that have been used in the pharmaceutical industry and also in the healthcare industry. Um, our system is an FDA-approved system. It's a 38-gram sensor um, that attaches. There's, there's three or four different configurations. It can either attach to a chest belt that I'm wearing at the moment. It can attach to an arm, wrist-based, or it could be a T-shirt-based uh, configuration. And, and what it can measure, it's, it's got three different types of data, which is very, very important to understand because the importance of this is, and, and moving from military to, to consumer, the important thing is what data is actually relevant for that particular set of consumers, that particular set of customers. We can go down to the rawest level to, uh, to actually collect in real time two leads of ECG, um, heart rate, heart rate variability, and interbeat intervals, breathing rate, skin temperatures, core body temperatures, um, acceleration. We have a triaxis accelerometer on board, so you can look at activity, speed, distance, time traveled, position, posture. Um, and then you know, the second layer of information above that and data above that is actually derived measures from this. They're mostly in the form of indexes, because an index is something that everyone understands, you know, a 0 to 10, a 0 to 100 index, whereas the consumer marketplace and most consumers may not want to see an ECG, may not want to know what their temperature is or their heart rate is. What they'll definitely understand is, on a scale of, for example, 0 to 100, this is what my stress level is, which is something we do. This is what my fitness level is. You know, there's a biometric identification um, marker that we have. Um, there's fitness activity, sleep quality data that you, can, that you can see up there, just to give a split about the sleep analysis and how it, uh, that person was, you know, the quality of their sleep during the past day or past few sessions. 
This data then is sent um, in real time to, uh, a, it could be a mobile device where we have our mobile applications, it can be directly to a PC, or it can be sent to, um, automatically uploaded to our cloud-based database. And from that, actually, um, a, a, an ap application can be pulled up on the web where you can have a, a web-based interface to allow for much more remote monitoring and uh, remote monitoring capabilities. Um, I'm actually wearing the system now. Unfortunately, this is quite small. I, a few technical hitches, and I can't put it up there. I can, if, if anyone's interested, I can show the panel now. But if anyone's interested, I can show you how it works. But what you have on this mobile is a summary set of my data, um, including heart rates that you, you guys can see. So you, you can see heart rates. This is coming from me at the moment. You can see all my heart rates, et cetera. And, and, and one of the most important things for remote monitoring is actually alarms and, and, and ensuring that the integrity of the data is good enough to be able to make a certain amount of decision. So there's, alarm, there's alarms determining whether the data quality is good enough. Is it above a certain confidence level? Is it above a certain threshold? There's what we call a PWI indicator, a personal welfare indicator, that effectively sets thresholds for a multitude of different parameters that we're collecting and gives you a simple red, amber, and green if it crosses or doesn't cross one of those particular thresholds. And then on top of that, we're actually seeing, on, on that mobile at the moment, I actually have a, a, a live two-lead two ECG actually being uh, shown and transmitted from myself. Thank you very much. Hello, my name's Colin Engel, and I'm the CEO and uh, co-founder of iRobot. I'm a robot guy. I've been building robots for, gosh, I don't know, since I was uh, nine. But I've been doing it professionally for about 23 years. And I um, want to talk a little bit about how robots um, have gone from sort of a, a dream and an idea into something more practical. Because robots have a challenge in that We've all grown up with them. We all believe that they can do amazing and wonderful things, everything uh, <clears throat> from wash dishes to uh, explore other planets, and, and to some extent they can. But we always get ahead of ourselves. And when I think about what is driving and motivating the robotic industry and myself, it's not this. It's a different robot from the movie Star Wars, at least for my journey personally. It's <coughs> very different guy. I'll show you in a second. Because if you think about the movie Star Wars, you had the Death Star. It was new. You had a real challenge on the Death Star because the rebels were coming, flying in to blow it up. The stormtroopers were on the Death Star. They were new because the Death Star were new. They didn't know where to go. And so this robot right here, was my inspiration. This robot, the MSC-6, when I saw the movie, I was not excited about by R2-D2. It was cool, but I didn't know how to do it. R2-D2 is cool. Not sure how it climbs stairs. <laughs> but this robot, <clears throat> I don't know if you remember, it's about the size of a bread box. It drove through, through, the, uh, the, through the Death Star. The, the uh, stormtroopers followed it. So it took them to the turbo lasers to shoot down the Rebel Alliance and, and tried to defeat the rebellion. It actually did something useful. And I saw that robot and said, you know, we could build that. And that's important. Because with technology, you have to find the intersection of be between what can be done and where is the need. So iRobot <clears throat> is probably most well known for the Roomba vacuum cleaner. But we've also put over 5,000 robots into the field in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places around the world to help save lives. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you a brief story about this robot. This is the PackBot. And uh, it's a hyper rugged real robot. You can throw it off a second story building and it will survive right itself and keep going, keep sending information back. How cool is that? Well, it's very cool. Uh, last year, or a little before then, this robot was the first and only robot that was sent into the Fukushima Daiichi reactor in Japan and was credited with allowing the cool shutdown of that reactor because of the information it was able to gather and create paths where the people could come in safely without being exposed to lethal doses of radiation. It also played an important role in Afghanistan. 
Here we have Sergeant Petri on the, uh, on the left with the pack bot in, the, uh, in his backpack, one of thousands of caves that was found in Afghanistan, many of them empty, many of them used as the village latrine, many of them containing some very, very scary stuff. So this is actually an image from inside that's all unstable AK-47 ammunition and C4 blocks that the, the robot was able to find and allow the soldiers to stay out of harm's way. I'm going to show you two videos and then pass the baton, which I think best characterize the importance of the use of robots in the military. <coughs> sort of an old way and a new way video. They decide to push it off the So here is a vehicular borne IED that uh, was being moved off by a, a Humvee. So remarkably, the, uh, the driver was, was survived that. It was an, an armored Humvee, and he was able to um, uh, walk away from that with only minor injuries. But if you listen to that soundtrack, compare that with this video. There's the OD's robot. So the robot is right there. That's the T-1000. Whoa, there goes their robot. I got, I got that on video. Poor robot. So I think those uh, two videos speak for themselves. These machines are very, very capable. By focusing on what the robot should be able to do, we can actually make things rugged enough, affordable, and get them in quantity into theater and make a difference. Uh, this is another um, a wonderful memento that uh, we receive at iRobot occasionally. Thank you. You have saved lives today. So <coughs> that's robots on the battlefield. Now I'd like to um, talk a little bit about a partnership that we made with InTouch Health. Yulin, uh, uh, Dr. Gupta did, did uh, mention Yulin. He's, he's a remarkable individual. He also was at the forefront of the invention of robotic telesurgery. And now we're trying to go bring robotics and healthcare together to allow doctors to be able to deliver their expertise anywhere where it's needed. So as we thought about how iRobot can make a difference with our navigation technology and some of the technology you just saw, combining it with the amazing work at InTouch Health to create a next generation doctor is <coughs> what I'd like to um, uh, have Yulin talk about. So, Yulin, CEO of InTouch Health. Thank you, Colin. The baton is now yours. Thank you very much. So, uh, as Colin said, he's a robot guy. I'm actually a robot guy too, but I came up through a different path. And I've been, I've been working in, in the healthcare side for, uh, I guess, a little over 20 years doing robotics in healthcare, where I started working in surgical robots. Um, then, what, you know, so I've been familiar with what's going on in the healthcare world for quite a while. And the challenges that we really face is, is quite simple. It's like, how do you provide high quality health care? How do you get everybody that high quality health care? And how do you do so at a lower cost? And so it turns out that you know, the statement's very simple, but doing that in reality is actually quite difficult. So where do robots uh, come into this? And, and, and we've been working uh, at InTouch and then with iRobot the last few years on how do you basically better leverage the, uh, the human capital, the healthcare expertise that we have. And we've actually been working for quite a while on something I'm about to show you, which is actually just in the verge of hitting the marketplace. So we're very, very excited. And so what I'm gonna show you here is a, is, a, is a robot, and we call it RP Vita. And it actually uh, combines technology that, uh, that InTouch has been working on together with the technology 
that uh, Colin was talking about a moment ago, and it, and it combines it into this platform which we call RP Vita. Now, so will you see me on the face of that? And so I'm going to keep looking at my screen here as opposed to looking straight at the audience. But this RP Vita is, is what we think of as a very uh, state-of-the-art robot, which is, allows me, imagine I was a physician. I can actually sit here and I can project myself to anywhere else in the world. And then what I can also do is I can move about in that environment and deliver care as if I was there. So for example, what I am uh, doing right now is I'm just hitting buttons on a map to show me where the robot should go. So imagine you have a, a, a hospital which has uh, many beds. Imagine you're in an emergency environment. And imagine that you are told to go to bed one or bed two or Mrs. Jones at bed three or Mr. Smith at bed four. I would actually, as the physician, I would actually just have the uh, ability to just hit a button, have the system bring me to the bedside of the, uh, of the patient where then I can actually go ahead and, and examine uh, my patient and deliver care. Now, and then once I'm there, I'm going to go ahead and uh, zoom in on this unsuspecting gentleman here. Okay, and then here, here I go. I'm going to take his picture, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and put that. Uh, it, it, so what I can do is I can actually store that picture into, the, um, into my electronic medical record, and then I can actually use it at a later time in order to, uh, uh, to either uh, put it in the medical record, or I can do things like this, which you should be seeing. And we're, we're a little bandwidth limited here, but you can see how I can actually project it on the face of the robot, and I can say, well, that's your eye, right? Do you see the little circle around your eye there? I don't know if people all over the, uh, the audience can, can see this, um, where, let's see, where you, you can look at the face of the robot, and it's no longer me on the face of it. It is, it is, uh, it is uh, this gentleman here. So the point is, is I can deliver care, and I can actually... Uh, provide um, uh, um, uh, the expertise that is otherwise difficult to get there. And so when I'm done doing that, I can actually then move the, uh, the system uh, off, the, off the stage. And I'm just going to send it over there. And, and there it's going by itself off, off to the side. It has a whole array of very sophisticated uh, sensors and, um, and, and, and and software which allow us to do that. And this system is going to be deployed uh, just in the next couple of months into hospitals like at UCLA, uh, several, of the, uh, several hospitals around the country, and in fact even we have some going into um, to Mexico and Canada as well. But just kind of, so after giving you a little bit of a concept of what this RPV is capable of, um, it fits under this umbrella of what we call telemedicine. And telemedicine is really about just getting the right expertise to the right place at the right time to do the right thing. And if you can do that effectively, you can actually provide higher quality care, access to all, and at a lower cost. So let me give you just a couple of examples of where this has come into play. So um, one area where we got involved in, and I guess this is uh, three years ago now, when the earthquake hit Haiti, uh, obviously there was a lot of challenges there. They're very under-equipped to handle the healthcare needs of the environment. And what we did is we sent down one of our, um, one of our robots, the predecessor to this guy, where the physicians at the Ryder Trauma Center, which is at University of Miami, could actually go and help take care of the patients down at Haiti. That robot is still there. It is still used frequently to help deliver higher quality care at Haiti. And then with the theme of this uh, session here, as Dr. Gupta already mentioned, in the lower left-hand side, that's a picture of uh, Chungbot. It's actually named after Dr. Kevin Chung, who is one of two 
burn specialists in the army. There's two in the world, okay, for, for the army. He's one of them. He actually, so that expertise is really needed all over the world. Uh, what, we ha what he was actually able to do is to provide a lot of expertise into the burn units in San Antonio, Texas. But even when he was deployed in Iraq, he could actually follow his patients from Iraq back through San Antonio at the Brook Army Hospital by using this remote presence capability. We now also have five systems in five different hospitals in Iraq where writer trauma is once again helping to deliver care into those environments. And then finally, just a very current story. This is um, at the, uh, this is San Hurricane Sandy, which is, which is weeks ago. And it was in the news where a physician who is a stroke neurologist gets paged for, uh, for a stroke consult where a patient at a, 30, at a hospital 30 miles away is, uh, is suffering a stroke. Powers out of his house. He jumps into his uh, pickup trucks. He drives up a hill. He gets a good 3G cellular signal. He's able to beam into the robot 30 miles away and deliver care to a patient at a hospital who would, uh, who, where the patient would otherwise not get it. So once again, in closing, it's really how do you really leverage the expertise in the best way possible? And what we're doing in collaboration with iRobot here, we think we, hopefully we showed you some of the, some, some of the past and what we're th seeing as, as the future in terms of bringing this expertise to where it's needed. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you. Do we have the, the sound plug uh, in this? Um, you have to jump out of slideshow mode, plug it in the first hole, and then hit a button that pops up on the screen. The newfangled technology. Uh, it's just a I don't know if it's, I think you have to jump out of slideshow mode real quick. And when you plug it in, the first hole, there should be a, a signal that pops up. Should I come down there and do it? I want to make sure that we, ah, oh, there we go. All right, just plugged in. Now there'll be a little button that'll, oh, it should pop up. Well, we'll try it, see how it goes. Um, sound is very important for this, even though I'm going to be talking about a visual medium, virtual reality. Um, it's sort of like film. Um, good sound can make bad film look better, and it's the same thing with this. So. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is virtual reality goes to war. Uh, whatever happened to virtual reality? Well, it's still alive and well, and there's been great advances in it. And I'm going to talk about some of the work that we've done over the last few years developing applications to address mental health needs um, of service members and veterans. This is work being done at the USC, University of Southern California Institute for Creative Technologies. We're a research center at USC. That's actually also uh, an Army UARC, a university affiliated research center. So we do a lot of work with the military. When the military decided to locate this at USC, the rationale was its proximity to Hollywood. They wanted to bring together uh, the assets that advanced graphics, special effects, narrative, um, game technology uh, that might be in that area and bring it together into this research institute. So we're sort of the unholy alliance between Hollywood, the military, and academia. Three completely different cultures, but we're all thrown together with the goal of building virtual reality and advanced multimedia simulations. Our group is the MedVR Research Group, um, and it's an interdisciplinary lab. And we cover areas of psych, cognitive, motor, and uh, we also do work with virtual humans. Now, we don't just do military work. Um, here's a couple of examples. Uh, that's what a, a child would see wearing a virtual reality headset as they turn and look around in a virtual classroom. We developed this to test uh, children with attention process impairments, ADHD, uh, pediatric TBI, and so forth. So it's like an aircraft simulator would serve to test and train piloting abilities. We have a classroom simulator to test cognitive function under a range of controllable conditions. As well, down in the bottom there, this is part of a rehab engineering research center that we have that focuses on using game technology for stroke and traumatic brain injury or spinal cord injury for physical and occupational therapy applications. So the idea is to make the very boring repetitive activities that are common in you know, 
repetitive rehabilitation, make it fun and engaging. And in this case, we're using the prime sense sensor, but we use the Kinect and other uh, computer vision type sensors to track full 3D movement and impart that movement into the game. Well, anyway, back to the point of the talk, virtual reality goes to war. Over the years, we've developed applications for the treatment of PTSD, um, a series of applications that are just coming out to put ourselves out of a job on the back end by doing a better job on the front end by training resilience, psychological fitness before people go to war. We've developed artificially intelligent virtual humans that we use to train clinicians. So basically the clinician can screw up a bunch with a digital patient before they get their hands on a live one. And um, also an online intelligent agent to provide a confidential um, access point for people to seek healthcare information that might ordinarily avoid that with a live provider because of the stigma or the lack of access or availability. And I'll show little instantiations of each. Now, here is what the new version of virtual Iraq looks like, and you'll see um, some clips popping up and a patient talking about it, but I just want to point out before we go into that, the data on the right shows one of the recent studies showing a significant drop in PTSD symptoms across treatment and that three-month follow-up. On the bottom are the individual data points, and you can see in that sample of 20 PTSD patients, 16 no longer met PTSD criteria at the end of a 10 session course going through virtual rack. And we can, the clinician can deliver a variety of contexts and control the activities that go on in those contexts, make explosions go off, change the time of day, weather conditions, um, a variety of scenes as you'll see here. When I'm trying to sleep or when I'm with my wife, when times when I don't want it to, to come up and me start thinking about it. Traumatic things are not normal. You cannot handle the, the things that you've seen and done. And this is a tool that has helped me out tremendously. Reliving the worst moments of his life has helped him to move on with his life. I'm probably about 80% of who I was before I left. But I think that's pretty good after seeing and doing the things that we've done. Okay. So, as I mentioned before, to put ourselves out of a job on the back end, we're developing what we nickname the Emotional Obstacle Course, but it's actually a project called STRIVE, Stress Resilience in Virtual Environments. And basically, the concept is to build a series of 30 Band of Brothers-like interactive narratives where the user is in a virtual reality environment, interacting with a squad, and the squad is going on missions, just like in a, instead of sitting on the couch, watching a TV show, you're in the TV show. Um, and in this case, what happens is at the end of each episode, something bad happens. And the bad thing that happens is based on the kinds of reports we've gotten from patients that have gone through the exposure therapy. So we know that it's based on user feedback. And so we create these experiences. I'm gonna pop up two of them simultaneously. There's some blue language here if anybody has any sensibilities uh, might want to leave now, but we've made it relevant for uh, military personnel going through these kinds of experiences. So here would be examples of that. Vehicle three. Fuck, BB, drive Fuck. man, go. go. This, this is vehicle three, go, we just go, got go. hit. We're down, we're down. So those are how the episodes end, but what we do at that moment, we don't just expose people and say, all right, they're gonna be ready for it when they get there. At that point, we deliver coping skill training by way of a virtual human character, a mentor that comes into the scene, as you'll see, and it's based on comprehensive soldier fitness training, something the military has already endorsed. Um, and here's an example of the mentor that might, I don't know if you ever watched Dexter. Dexter's dad pops up in the scene periodically. Well, that's what the mentor does. He'll pop up in the vehicle. He'll walk through the rubble and appear. Sometimes you go Let's to a briefing room. Let's start learning how your body reacts to stress. I'm showing slices now of one of these. The caveman part of your brain, the amygdala, goes into action. Its job is to identify threats. If the shit you're in is real, the caveman starts beating his drums, sending signals throughout your body, telling it to get ready. I worked with a sergeant who stayed amped after serious encounters, sometimes for days. Not good. When you get a chance to lower your guard, you want to make sure you help your body recover from the stress response that was initiated. 
One way of doing this is through a simple breathing exercise. It can help calm your heart, normalize your breathing, decrease blood pressure, and help you sleep. So then we'll train the, uh, this breathing exercise using a visualization. Let's try it a couple more times. Breathe in silently through your nose, deep into your belly. Now slowly exhale from your mouth. Let me hear it. So our rationale is that uh, considering a generation of soldiers that have grown up digital, we think that immersing folks in the training environment um, may appeal to this generation and engage them in a way that uh, they might not get by way of a death by PowerPoint type presentation over a two day briefing. Uh, we actually build the stories so that you're going through it. And hopefully the learning in those environments will be more readily transferred to when it really happens and that you'll be able to rely on these various tactics that we try to teach. Finally, um, I mentioned training. I'm just going to show a quick clip. Our center has been building virtual humans for the last 10 years for a variety of purposes. And we started building virtual patients back in 2007, some of the previous ones. But here's a clip of a social worker in training. Good afternoon, Sergeant Castilla. What brings you in today? Well, my wife told me she thought I should talk to someone. She's been pretty concerned about me since a soldier suicide on base last week. This is a suicide you assessment. Did you know the soldier? Yes. He wasn't a friend, but I met the Marine once or twice. He seemed normal at the time. I guess I'm afraid I might end up like him. Do you have any plans to hurt yourself? No. It certainly caught my mind, especially lately. I just need it all to stop. Sometimes I can't handle it. So this goes on, Sergeant, but if you get the, the concept here, the idea is um, to be able to train, uh, in this case, uh, at a master's in social work uh, program, uh, folks that are more familiar with military challenges and uh, you know, general training over a course of uh, situations that they might not get in their real hands-on training with a live standardized patient uh, training methodology when that is in fact available, which is not often in the psychological and social work areas. Finally, to make it so that folks that are hesitant to seek care with a live provider, uh, where they can get access in a private confidential interaction with not a doc in a box, but a guide that can help them find healthcare information online. We built this for the military, but the architecture exists now to do this across all civilian uh, areas. And I'll just let him talk for a few minutes or for a minute Hi there. or two. The name's William Ford, but you can call me Bill. Welcome to SimCoach. Hi, Bill. So what's SimCoach? SimCoach is a safe place for war fighters and their families to talk about the things that are on their minds. So who are you? I'm a virtual human, which means that I'm based on the real experiences and personalities of actual war fighters and their families. Anyway, I'm here to listen and I'm here to help. Anything you want to talk about? Talk to you? How do I do that? Well, you're doing it right now. Just type in regular English. Anything troubling you? If there is, why would I want to talk to you about it? Well, here, I'll tell you what. I made a video that tells you a little bit more. I'm gonna pop it up over here on the right. Not all the wounds of war are physical. When you don't dress a wound, it gets worse, doesn't it? Sim Coach is here to talk about the issues weighing on your mind without worrying about anyone finding out about it. You start off by choosing the SIM coach that's right for you. Oh, hi. Hope you weren't waiting long. Welcome to SIM coach. I'm Ellie. Then just type in English. Ellie can listen, understand, and respond. If you don't mind, I'd like to ask a few questions so I can figure out how to help you better. Is that okay? Everything you say here is completely anonymous, and we've taken a lot of steps to keep it that way. If you don't mind my asking, how's your sleeping been lately? Here's a link on the do's and don'ts of good sleep hygiene. Ellie can send you links to resources, show you a video, administer questionnaires, give you advice, or just tell you a story. So my younger brother Alex was in the Marines and deployed twice. I don't want to say I know what he went through, because I don't. But something he said kind of reminded me of something you might be going through. But the most important thing she'll do is listen to yours. That must have been really rough. 
Go ahead and tell me more about that, if you can. SimCoach was developed by a whole group of docs, computer geeks, experts, and writers to be as helpful as possible. And the more the people use it, the better it's getting all the time. SimCoach, a safe place to talk to someone at a time when it's needed most. Just head. So uh, the rationale here is that we can have the best treatments in the world, but if people don't access them because of stigma, fear that they'll, their career will be, in the military will be impacted or people will think less of them, uh, then the treatment isn't going to do any good. So this is a persuasive sort of an application that's designed to help somebody take the first step to move towards seeking care with a live provider, not a replacement. Now, if you're interested in more of this, I just want to make a quick pitch on January 20th. Uh, Sanjay Gupta's weekly show on CNN, The Next List, um, will feature uh, a lot of this work. Uh, I think it's on at 2 o'clock um, on CNN. So uh, thank you. Thank you. OK, well, we're, we're going to open it up uh, for questions in, in, in just a minute. We've got a couple of mics over here. If you, if you ask a question, just maybe tell us who you are. And, uh, but let, let me just start off, uh, Skip, with, with you. Uh, with post-traumatic stress, uh, there's obviously a lot of people who have come up with different strategies to try and treat this. How well does this work, and how does it compare to other treatments that are out there? Um, well, exposure therapy, it sounds counterintuitive at first when you, when you first hear about it. Like, why would you make somebody that's got PTSD go back and face the you know, the situations that they went through. But what's found in the literature, and exposure therapy in its traditional form, in imagination exclusively, is an evidence-based practice. It shows the best clinical efficacy of any treatment, medication even, um, for reducing symptoms and, I don't want to say curing PTSD, but bringing a person to a point where they can manage uh, their PTSD. Um, so it, as Counterintuitive as it may seem, you know, like the old thing about don't talk about the war in front of them. Well, it's better to confront and process those memories, but to do it in a safe environment with a clinician that can systematically ramp up the level of provocativeness. Like some of the things I showed in these videos, certainly wouldn't do that in the first session or maybe even at all. Mm -hmm. It would always start off very gradual, getting the patient to talk about things that they don't normally talk about. So that's really the, the case with that. Uh, there's currently four randomized controlled trials that are ongoing with this, but the initial open clinical trials and anecdotal work with it are, have all been pretty much universally positive. Gotcha. Um, uh, Anmol, you know, one of the things that comes up, I imagine, with a lot of this, this, this field of, of quantifying yourself is just how accurate is it? And I, I imagine you do a lot of studies and you compare it to the gold standard in terms of things, but you mentioned a two lead, essentially a two lead EKG versus a 12 lead, which is what you get in a hospital. How, how good, what value is that uh, to the practitioner? Sure, so when you're looking at the, the quality, the accuracy of the data, what you, what you have to make sure is that systems and end-to-end and -end solutions like ours aren't there to actually replace a clinician. They're not there to replace doctors. They're there to provide an assistance and a, a proactive measure to better inform both the individual who's using the systems and the, the clinician and uh, the uh, doctors with more information, more data to make better, better decisions. And one thing you're absolutely right, you know, not every application in the world needs a two-lead ECG to be seen. You, know, you need what's derived from that, which could be heart rate or could be your HRV or could be your stress levels. But, um, when you're getting down to um, being able to view two lead ECGs, what we're really looking at is remote telemedicine. And we're looking at, you know, if in the US, you know, there's, there's obviously been a lot being made of um, the Obama healthcare reforms and, and the 30 day rules, for example. So you can imagine instances where, you know, doctors, hospitals, clinicians will want to see more and more data, more clinical grade data. So, yes, you're right, it might not be 12 leads, but it, it, at least it's two leads. While a patient's not you know, sitting in a hospital bed in a, in a hospital, they're actually at home, they're going about doing day-to-day -day activities, and they're actually able to make much more relevant decisions and, and gain much more relevant um, information about that particular person in real-world environments. And just, just a real, real quick follow-up, you know, one thing that comes up in healthcare a lot is studies are done on certain populations of people, healthy people, for example, or a guy in Felix Baumgarten's case who breaks the sound barrier uh, without a craft. Um, 
how relevant is that to, to people sitting in the audience? I mean, pe and also people in hospitals who actually have medical problems. Does it translate well? Well, you know, a lot of, obviously, we got a lot of exposure from the, the Red Bull jump. And, and a lot of the time, what people were asking was, this just looks like a marketing stunt, to be honest. And, and what relevance does it have in real world uh, and real life situations? So, and the, the fact is, there is a lot of relevance that this information, the data captured, and the actual analysis that they did has in real world examples. For us as a, as a company, for a start, it actually shows how robust and effective our systems are working under those kind of extreme environments. And if you look at, if you look at the adoption of products and new technologies across you know, any sector, what, what you can prove is if you're able to work in the most ruggedized environments, then therefore it should be more applicable, the, the, the quality of the data, the consistency of the data, the reliability of the systems in other less harsh environments like consumer, like healthcare, like in hospital. Um, but apart from that, if you, if you look at the data they were collecting, what they were trying to understand is, and this is the first time that uh, a human being has traveled at supersonic speeds. So what they're actually looking at is how do human dy dynamics cope? How, do they, how does the body adapt? How does the body perform under that kind of extreme pressure? And what all that data is going to go back into is things like space med medicine research, um, actually developing better um, spacesuits for, for astronauts and also for civilian travel. It's going to go into understanding when people are undergoing harsh or, or different reactions or environments, mm. even if it could be in a, in a healthcare setting. Actually, being able to collect that data shows that, you know, different scenarios and different situations they could work with. It just, and just real quick, it was fascinating to watch the jump, obviously. Um, any nuggets you can share? I mean, did they learn anything uh, that uh, you've uh, seen so far that's interesting? Yeah, so obviously there's, there's a big NDA, so uh, there's, there's a few things we could... The, the, the actually, the scariest part of the jump, we were actually in, um, in talks with an emailing mission control during the, the entire jump, and actually when Felix started spinning, because he did about three trial jumps, so he did one from, which doesn't sound, you know, from about... Uh, 25,000 meters, which is you know just a walk in a park for him apparently. Uh, he did, and and you know 38,000 was was where he was trying to get to. But when he was spinning, it was actually one of the probably one of the scariest moments for the whole team. Uh, I mean the Red Bull team, Felix's personal physiologist, and uh, everyone involved, including us, because we we didn't know, and you can't you you almost can't model what will happen to the human body when they're spinning in that many different directions, traveling at that kind of speed in that environment. So actually, the fear of the unknown with that particular spin part of the, the jump was probably one of the, well, I, I wouldn't say it's a failure because he came out of it and he came back controlling. There's actually great data, you know, from a, from a data point of view. I'm quite, uh, I'm, I'm quite selfish. We have it. good news and bad news. <laughs> <laughs> so he could have done that on purpose, but no, no. He, uh, um, that, that part where he was spinning was probably the, the, yeah. the scariest part. It's quite extraordinary. Colin, uh, you know, I'm surprised this looks more like R2-D2 than I thought it was going to look like, considering the big red X through the... Uh, <laughs> what, what, what is it? What, why, why health? I mean, you showed the videos of what you were working on, and you've been doing this since your college days at MIT, is, is that right? I mean, right. you said since you were nine years old, but in a real way, uh, how, how did that transition or the interest in health develop? Well, I think that uh, as you, there's so many things and areas where robotics could have impact. You have to, you know, in five minutes in a blank piece of paper, you can give yourself six life's works. And so you have to prioritize where do you think the technology uh, is ready to have a meaningful impact. I, I, my goal is to have impact personally. And when I think about the, the challenges facing our healthcare system, uh, you know, it's, we need healthcare at home. The economics, uh, with all the technology we have of, of actually sending people uh, into hospitals uh, and then into assisted living, it just doesn't work. We don't have enough younger people around to take care of the older people. And so it's sort of that realization has become a bit of a, uh, a driving force in, in, in my life to say, okay, well, here's a, a huge, I use the expression, you know, we're racing toward a bridge abutment and we need to be able to find a solution before we hit it. And we're going to hit it in my lifetime. And so here's a way that the technology that I've understood and grown up with can actually help us move course provide low-cost care <clears throat> by first centralizing um, or centralizing, allowing doctors to provide their expertise generally within hospitals, but then also bring that technology and that expertise into the home so we can 
age in place, extending our independent living longer and longer, mm -hmm. decreasing our reliance on assisted living, changing the whole uh, economics of healthcare, and hopefully um, getting us to a place to the point where when I need it, society will be able to afford it. That's great. Let's, let's take a question Do we have here. time for one question? Thank you, gentlemen, for such an uh, exciting start to the morning. My name is Donna Cryer. I um, am CEO of Cryer Health and counsel a lot of patients with very complex uh, conditions. And I, I had a question for Dr. Rizzo about uh, the applications for virtual reality uh, psychological resilience training for patients facing very uh, traumatic, arduous, uh, complex treatment regimes like cancer or infertility or organ transplantation in, in, in my case, and being able to help them anticipate um, and to weather uh, being able to get through such a difficult experience. And so are there any plans to start working on those types of cases? Uh, I think the key thing is, is to keep in mind what does VR add over already existing methodologies? Um, and, and in line with that as well is what works now and how can we take the theoretical basis that drives the effectiveness of what works now and do it a little bit better by bringing a person into a simulation where they're immersed in a world and they can interact in a natural way. So um, facing uh, you know, a, a heart transplant, I'm not so sure if, um, putting, if, if there's a simulation that would really add value uh, other than maybe perhaps familiarizing a person with the procedures in advance, but I would see um, things like online um, health, health support agents being helpful in being a buddy after the surgery that they could interact with, could get prompts perhaps on, on the follow-on health care that they have to do in the home, uh, medication prompting. We're actually uh, starting to build a sim coach like character as a virtual buddy for folks that are in the beginning stages of dementia so that they can still live at home, but they've got a pal that's on the computer that can remind them to take their meds, that um, can do reminiscence type therapies, um, uh, play checkers with them. Um, and also you can input biographical information into the sim coach's logic model so that the character knows specifically about the names of all the person's children, the grandchildren, um, and can interact and provide prompting in that way. So I, I would see an online interactive agent as being more useful for those things. I'm not sure if you can really uh, prepare somebody for a surgical procedure. I know people do this, but I'm not sure about building a virtual world to do that if it adds value over what we already do now. Thank you. But I'd like to try it. <laughs> Let me just ask uh, you, you know, one last question. I know we're, we're basically out of time, but give us a little bit of a glimpse of the future. If you open up the horsepower on this thing, what, what is it that you, what would, might this look like in a few years from now? I think that the, um, the opportunity is to transform healthcare delivery in ways which, uh, you know, and other industries have already gone, law, accounting, et cetera, where the expert isn't where the, the customer or client is. And by using these robotic avatars, you can actually get the expert where you need it, whenever you need it. Now, so if you get very specific, so Colin was talking about extending that expertise outside the hospital which is uh, into assisted living, into long-term care, into uh, outpatient clinics, and into even the home. And, that, and, I, and I completely believe that's gonna happen as well. And, but you can even look even a little more near term, which is even, even in the hospital setting, as you know well, I mean, hospitals are huge. You've got ICUs, you've got emergency departments, you've got wards, you've got, you've got these things which are millions of square feet and getting the right expertise to the right place at the right time, especially a very common thing uh, these days are like team rounds, right? Mm -hmm. A team round where it might take a neurosurgeon, a neurologist, a physical therapist, a dietitian, et cetera, who all have to converge on a patient at a specific time and perhaps even a family member. And th these are the kind of mechanisms which can actually help synchronize these difficult asynchronous processes. And I think that's gonna happen soon and that kind of thing can really improve healthcare delivery 
now in terms of quality access and reduced costs. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Elin, Anmul, Colin, uh, Skip Rizzo, hand for so, our panel. Thank well, you Well, everyone, much. round of applause for an unbelievable, <laughs> privileged, privileged session for all of them. So I'm going to ask you a quick question and a quick favor. Not a question, no answer. Um, I, I'm going to have them uh, be walked outside. You can talk to them afterwards. We're having some interviews with them first. So please just kind of make way, kind of like you're in church or something, make part the river, part the sea. Uh, for them to for them to get through, I'd appreciate it. Thank you so much. And we're